Hi, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for, to Kiki for being here and agreeing to do this interview. Uh, we're super excited to talk with you about your paper, all things related to philosophy and also just what's going on in your life right now. Firstly, I guess it's only fitting to ask because we're in the midst of this global pandemic right now. Uh, what have you been up to during this lockdown in terms of maybe TV shows, movies, doesn't have to be related to philosophy, books that you've been enjoying, uh, hobbies, basically anything. It's a free for all question. Yeah, I mean, during this holiday in the UK, we've, we, it's kind of been weird because we've been like at school, not at school, depending on like what the government has set out. But I mean, just like most other people in the UK, I've got addicted to watching football or like soccer, like wherever you go, Canada. So I'm really into my soccer. I support Man United, greatest team in the world. Watched a lot of Man United football. I've um, also watched uh, quite a lot of basketball as well. Really getting into that, just sports in general. And then reading a few, a few of my favorite philosophy books. Well, I, I've read a couple of them again. I read Nietzsche's Genealogy of Morality again. And then, you know, doing some like personal work because outside of philosophy, I like coding. I like that kind of technical stuff, you know, made a few projects, just trying to keep myself occupied in this nonsense. Because I feel like you can get really bored and let yourself go if you just let the day slip. Right. Yeah, that's that's an awesome variety of things like philosophy, coding, football, slash soccer. Um, have you... I guess on the topic of books, since you briefly brought it up, we always like talking about books, but what have been some of your favorite books? Obviously, you mentioned Genealogy of Morals. Um, is, there, is there anything else that, that has caught your eye recently or not so recently? Yeah. I've seen a couple more recently because I read Ethics and Limits of Philosophy. I only read like the first, like, because there's different versions and there's also like a version where there are other authors that give their commentary on it. So it's like a lot easier to follow along and you can kind of see different opinions. So I got this uh, version of Ethics and Limits of Philosophy with some commentary in it, some summaries of the different arguments of the different chapters. And I found that really interesting to read. And I also read, um, you know, The Plague by Camus, which is like pretty yes. good. I just read that. That was quite a good read. It well. was, yeah, yeah. I, I, I had the chance to read The Plague as well and it was fantastic, but... Um, I guess another thing that people, this is kind of nerding out on the subject of books, but I feel like this is a nice rabbit hole to go down, but when you read these, obviously philosophy books aren't, they're, they're different, they're a different experience from reading, for example, a fictional book, right, because you have to critically think about the ideas in the book and sort of maybe come up with your own refutations uh, and, and crit criticisms, but kind of what is your process of reading, you mentioned that you reread these books, maybe what is your process like like do you take notes on the books like in what manner do you do you take those notes what what is your process of grappling with these ideas and sort of retaining them yeah with philosophy books I think it can be like difficult especially for people that are new subject to kind of read the books because it's not like a textbook where you just like it just kind of tells you stuff right out so me I, I don't think I've ever straight read a philosophy book without like I always watch YouTube video I always watch some YouTube video watch some kind of podcast before because there's usually a lot of like flowery terms or different lingo that they're using that if you don't know what it is it will just be hard to kind of grasp the whole thing so I always watch some YouTube videos I always you know read some articles on it before I usually sometimes I get book recommendations from my friends so I'll give them an ask on, on how to kind of navigate the thing before I even go and read it so it makes it a lot easier when I read the books and as for my process while I'm reading the book I usually like sometimes I, I frame my the book around like a question a particular question that I want to answer because if you frame around a question that you want to answer it's a lot easier to kind of like guide your reading and once I feel like I guide my reading, I feel like it's a lot easier to, to actually extrapolate something from the book, which is why, again, if I have a different question or something else that I'm interested in, I'll reread the book again, because when you have something different in mind to guide, you can get lots of different stuff out of it. That's just right. me. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And this is, and this, I guess, also ties into your research paper, which, or not your mm. research paper, your philosophical paper, which... I don't want to go too into depth because Jeff is going to talk about that later, but just briefly, what was the process of maybe selecting the topic, sort of going about the process of 
reading these articles and finding these pieces of literature to guide your argument within the paper. I hope that's not touching too much on the paper territory, yeah. but yeah. Um, like in terms of the process for finding that, it was always kind of a question that I was really interested in mm. understanding in the first place. And given like the current affairs that were going on at that time, different rights, oh, those kind of like current, uh, different rights, protests, violent protests, these kind of questions were being made permanent, not only, uh, sorry, pertinent rather, not only in my kind of like own political consciousness, but I feel like it was getting more international reputation, national reputation. So I thought that was a good time. And then in terms of my process for selecting it, as I said, it's usually a thing where I just saw stuff on YouTube or random articles and things like that. And that's what kind of initially got me into it. And then when I saw where I wanted to kind of take it, I just started applying like the relevant philosophical knowledge that I had and then knowing which sort of philosophers would speak about this kind of thing. And I just went to consult their, their earlier works. Right. Are there, I'm personally curious to know, are there any YouTube channels or podcasts or just other maybe modern philosophers or figures you kind of look up to uh, in particular? I feel yeah. like viewers might be interested in that, yeah. In terms of the, the best philosophy podcast, there's one po podcast on Apple, it's called like Philosophize This. Yes. Like the, the, yes, it's definitely the best one I've had. I think that was one of the first things that even got me into philosophy in the first place. I mean, they're not too long. They're only like 40 minutes-ish. And I always listen to them like, you know, when I'm having a shower sometimes or when I'm about to go to bed. And it's, it's really good as I said, as a kind of like introduction to get you at least introduced to kind of the language or the lingo that a particular philosopher uses through the lens of somebody that kind of knows what they're on about. And then you can always, if you like the sound of it, you can always go and if you don't, you can just kind of ignore it. That's definitely the best one in my opinion. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think because a lot of people are sort of intimidated by the idea of philosophy and all this fancy language like you talked about. Um, but philosophize this is very is a very approachable way to first get interested in sort of an overview of, of philosophy and the key figures. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you briefly talked about sort of looking at international news, current events, and getting inspiration for your topic off of that. I know sort of a lot of people are divided on the opinion of some philosophers are like, it's better to not read the news and sort of steer clear from more shallow dopamine fueled content and rather just sit there and like on their armchairs reading books. Whereas mm -hmm. other philosophers say it's essential to look at the news, apply these ethical dilemmas to different situations going on in the world and in your particular country. So what is your hot take on that? Do you, are you an avid news reader? What sorts of, do you read across the spectrum? Yeah, I mean, with regards to just addressing that kind of initial point with the difference between like, you know, your kind of more stereotypically introspective philosophers, people that think you can assess stuff just by like, you know, looking introspectively and, and arguing that you don't have to like interact with the world around you to gain access to the truth. I mean, on, on that note, I, I would disagree with that in the sense that I think engaging in public life, engaging with others is it's not only is it more rewarding it gives you access to a lot more different things and the idea that you can just kind of stay by yourself and learn things it's like even if that's true like but how are you going to apply this knowledge what's, what's this actually going to do what's actually going to change you know that's always what I'm thinking about yeah. but on the same on the kind of same token I would agree that just engaging because like, their argument right is that you know me mass media and things like that it's built to condition, it's built to not give you the truth necessarily. And that's definitely true. I mean, they, they, they sell you ads these days, but at the same time, you just have to kind of, as I said before, you always have to have a purpose when you're guiding your reading in the same way. You always have to have a purpose and be aware of what you're trying to get from when you're on the news. You have to understand that their goal isn't necessarily to, to give you whatever concept of, of truth that really exists, if there is such a thing right it's, it's it's to deliver you news in whatever whatever fashion so just take that and do what you want with it but just always keep that in your mind that's what i would say yeah i <laughs> in the spirit of a true philosopher sort of questioning things and building your own questions and then searching for things based off of what you sort of the guiding question in the beginning i really like that idea um what i guess this is something that obviously we try to ask everyone is like what got you into philosophy in the first place now you briefly answered this before but 
uh, why is philosophy so interesting to you? Uh, because there's a lot of, obviously there are skeptics, people who say philosophy is useless, philosophy doesn't teach you technical skills, just get a CS degree instead, but what draws you to, to philosophy? I mean, what initially drew me to philosophy is just that I thought that, you know, the typical things about how there were so, I just felt that people were kind of taking so many things for granted, so many things, just assuming so many things that I didn't really necessarily, like, it wasn't even that I thought they were wrong. I just thought it was interesting that people just assume them. And I was always trying to think as critically as I could about all of these different subjects. And then my friends kind of noticed that I had these kind of traits. So they just recommended me some philosophy, recommended me some YouTube videos to watch. Like they just told me about like, oh, I'll just watch Crash Course Philosophy, like first five videos kind of thing. And then I just watched it, ended up watching the series and then listen to some philosophize this podcast. It was just interesting to me. And I just kind of went down different rabbit holes, experimented with lots of different literature. I was just kind of having fun with it. It wasn't even a school thing. So that's how I got into it initially. And then I've just been going on since there. That's great. I, I feel like this is the perfect time to pass the mic to Jeff to sort of ask about this particular rabbit hole that you went down. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it is a good time. I was just really enjoying that back and forth. And I have a few things to say about right off the top, um, what we call soccer, you call football. Um, yeah. I'm a Liverpool fan, Kiki. So I don't know, should we continue the interview at this point? Or since uh, you're a United fan, should we just maybe stop it here? I mean, usually back in the day when, when the two teams were competing well, it would have been a bit more of a grudge. But considering you're not even in Champions League, I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think that I'm too insecure anymore. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, we could keep going on this front, but maybe when we uh, stop recording, I'll I'll say a few other disparaging things about Man United. We'll, we'll continue the back and forth. But before we do that, let's talk about your paper. Um, your paper is titled in the uh, 2020 fall edition of Dialexicon. Does violence have a place in politics? So a provocative topic, of course, violence. We've seen all kinds of violence um, unfold on the streets all around the world. Um, of course, you know, this, is, this has been typical for, for many years, but especially in the past year, um, we've seen violence on the streets. And so I'm just curious, um, what, what kind of um, inspired you to write about violence in its relationship to politics and philosophy generally? What, like, yeah, what was the kind of the impetus for that, that topic? In terms of like the kind of immediate impetus for me to write about it, at least at this particular moment, obviously, given the protests that were going on worldwide, I'd seen a lot of debates around this in contemporary kind of political discussion. It was very high on like the political order of importance, it seemed, whether it's like people talking about from the House of Commons to just like, you know, YouTube, things like that. So I just saw loads of people talking about it. But it was also something that I'd always been thinking about for a while. I mean, we see different forms of violence all the time. And I just felt that in some situations, it's, it's underlying and accepted more. And in some situations, it's not. And at the very least, I just wanted to explore why we have those connotations to different um, spheres of violence in general. And I just thought it was a really interesting to go down, thing to go down, given that it's shaped human history all the time. I mean, how many wars have there, have there been? How many conflicts have there been? Like, yeah. it's just something that's so important, but it's so taboo at the same time. Right. Yeah. And, and like a good um, young philosopher, you take a, uh, a provocative and nuanced and original position on violence, um, something that deviates from just the norm that you hear in the media. Um, and for, for viewers of this uh, interview, I recommend that you go read uh, Kiki's paper in the 2020 edition. But for those of you who haven't and, and, and won't, um, Kiki takes the really, as I said, kind of nuanced and original position that the relationship between violence and politics is essential and, and almost unavoidable. And it's always kind of under undergirding um, all political actions. So maybe Kiki, do you want to kind of speak to how you arrived at that conclusion? Because many people will say, and you write this in your paper, they ask the question, when is violence acceptable, right? Or is violence acceptable in politics, et cetera? But you're saying that's actually not really the right question because it's, it's almost always there in some way or another. And so to ask, you know, should it be there is almost a moot point. So maybe do you want to speak to that a little bit? Oh, well, I mean, the, the first way I kind of saw that 
the, the, the origins and the kind of like first way I, I, I knew I was going to end up taking this position is that almost all political philosophies, apart from anarchism, which I do touch on as well, they, 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 the locus of their like political philosophy is a, is a nation state or a state of some sort. And then the disagreements are like, what should the state do? Who should the state serve? Um, what actions are legitimate for this state to take? But if you actually look at what the state is, I mean, ever since like, I think it was the 30 years war where you had like Treaty of Westphalia and that whole concept of like Westphalian sovereignty, a state is literally defined as an entity that has a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence within a given area. So for example, if you look at like the UK, it's a sovereign state because the only legitimate arbiter of violence in the UK is the state. And once I kind of understood that, then the necessary link between political ideology and violence became clear. Because if you look at what a, a political ideology does, it kind of is there to say what um, political ends or political goals are legitimate or illegitimate. So for example, for Marx, he'll say, you know, that he, he highlights, you know, necessary, highlights class distinctions, which he see, sees are immoral and contrary to human progress. And therefore you have to have a dictatorship of the proletariat, use the mechanisms of the state in order to advance his political ends. And that's gonna entail violence because that's what the state is centered around. And if you look at a liberal, the, um, like whether it's a classical liberal or modern liberal, they all kind of focus their political philosophy on some conception of human rights or, uh, or, or like human rights. Yeah, human rights essentially. And you protect those rights with violence because you have to have a court and the court makes a decision. And if somebody, so, so say like the right to property or whatever, the whole point is that if someone comes to take your property, you'll have an impartial court with an impartial judge who is able to decide whether, so say someone steals your thing, they have to give it back. And if they don't give it back, it will be taken from them with some form of violence, right? So it's like ultimately different political ends are backstopped by that ultimate threat of violence. So violence is literally at the center of all political philosophy. And that's the conclusion that I tried to explain in, in the essay that I wrote. Right, yeah, and I can see a skeptic saying, well, well, that's not that's not true because um, we just we never you know we don't see this kind of violence manifesting or unfolding in the state. Mm -hmm. It's such a healthy democracy; it's so peaceful. But your argument would be, well, no. Well, we actually do see this bubble up from time to time, and if the times we don't see it bubble up, it's still there as kind of a logical conclusion of certain actions that if mm -hmm. people were to disobey, then you would see it really you know rear its head. And so that's what I could see a skeptic saying, well, I look around and the world is ostensibly peaceful, um, or at least in like certain democratically motivated countries. Mm -hmm. um, you would say, well, that's, what would you say to that objection kind of in addition to what, what I just said? Well, firstly, I would say that even if you look at, at a domestic level, cool, we could argue that. I would say you still have a police force, you still have certain but let, let's just ignore the domestic fear. Let's say there was no domestic violence or threat of violence at all. Still, if that state wants to protect itself, it's going to have to have the threat of violence against other states. That's why we've had wars. That's why you have border conflicts. That's why you have different kind of military interventions. So even on, it, it's not just that on a domestic level with regards to like the police and the law courts. It, you also see it on an international level where you want to make sure that your neighbors don't see you as weak or whatever. And I mean, all countries that are democratic all still have militaries to the, but like most of them. And those that don't, it's usually because they're situated in a territory that's so irrelevant that no one would care to invade them. Like if you look at some of the most peaceful nations such as Switzerland, for example, Switzerland is one of the most, has one of the most efficient militaries in the whole of Europe. If you look at World War II, it wasn't that, um, they like what people people sometimes get confused peaceful means everyone's your friend it's actually everyone's your enemy more, more of the time if you look at during world war ii or that when switzerland didn't intervene they shot down allied planes and they shot down nazi planes so that kind of threat of violence or their ability to say 
if you incur on my on on what is mine which is dependent on what your political ideology is that's where the what's mine i will be prepared to use the threat of violence it still underlies all elements of both domestic and international politics that's what i would say right no of course great great answer i had a feeling that's what you'd say and um you even you even added on to it in ways that i i wasn't expecting once again for readers um or viewers of this interview who haven't read the paper i encourage you to read it um but if you don't Here's a quote from uh, Kiki's paper, page eight. Quite frankly, to say that one is not willing to use violence for political ends is equivalent to saying that one is not willing to consume food to satisfy their hunger. I think that's, that's a really interesting um, analogy or comparison is that the use of violence is actually, it's so fundamental to the way in which we kind of interact. It's, it's almost kind of um, similar as you, as you indicate to the primitive desire or the instinctual desire for for food in this sense. Um, so, do you do you view violence as it's 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 that deeply rooted in our interactions um, with others, right? And just because, once again, for like, what we don't see this violence, that's not what you're saying. You're saying, yeah, but you don't see it because it's actually there, but kind of in a subversive way. And almost the fact that it's subversive allows us to have this this uh, level of peace on the surface because it actually is there underneath in hidden ways. What do, you, what do you think about that? Do you agree or want to say anything about that? I would say that the whole point about it being so fundamental that it kind of goes under the surface, I would say that, that, that that's the point I was trying to make. If you look at the states that are the most peaceful, it's the ones that have been able to kind of monopolize the legitimate arms of violence within a given area. If you look at countries where there's lots of different groups all competing for that violence, you get a bunch of people fighting each other and it's not a great place to live. If you look at some countries with civil wars, that the reason you have a civil war is because there's not a clear distinction of who has the legitimate use of violence and, and who doesn't. As soon as it becomes uneven, you get skirmishes, which is why, back to the international politics point, which is why people are so obsessed, not just with who has power and who doesn't and who's powerful and who isn't, but balance of power. That's why you always hear that. That, that phrase of oh, we want to maintain the balance of power the balance of power because when everything's balanced and it can just go underneath and people can forget about it we can have nice interactions which we all want but when that's not the case things tend to just go a bit left so that's what i'd say on that right right no fantastic answer and um this is perfect for dialexicon we love these like really uh, original and um provocative takes on these so another um speaking of being provocative um you make a comment, page eight, fascist and liberal ideologies do not differ in the presence of violence, merely mm -hmm. in distribution and management, right? So for many people, they're saying, what? Fascist and, and liberal ideology, are you, are you kidding? Of course they're different, right, in, in, in many respects. And you acknowledge that they're different, but you're saying, well, maybe it's a difference in degree, not kind, um, when it comes to violence in particular. Um, what, what, do you, what do you have to say about that, that quote in particular? I would say it's not even a difference in degree because uh, let me just make the original point and then I'll get back to that. So essentially my point, as you said, was that they don't differ in their use of violence. They differ in the way they distribute it, the way they manage it and where they see it legitimate to be used in the first place. If you look at a liberal, they say you have these human rights and the state is there to defend those human rights. If you look at John Locke, he says, we have natural rights given to us by God and it is the state's uh, re uh, responsibility uh, he literally describes him as a night's watchman to enforce those rights and enforce has the word force because it means use force if necessary imagine if a liberal was like the state will protect your human rights but we won't use violence so if someone comes to your house and like you know robs you we'll just ask them very very nicely to <laughs> give your stuff you know you have to defend it and ultimately it comes that, down to that ultimate threat of violence. The reason a liberal would disagree with a fascist is not because a fascist is willing to use violence to achieve his political ends, it's that he disagrees with the political ends of a fascist, say, eradicating a, a group of people for like no reason. Do you understand? That's where the liberal and the fascist would differ, not in their administration of violence in, in, in that kind of whole term. Like <laughs> most, polit most people have political ideologies aren't pacifist. There's a big difference between being quite, what we view as peaceful in our modern times 
and like being a pacifist. They're two very different things. Right, right. But, sorry, sorry to go on. My, no, when, no, no. They don't differ in degree. I mean, we, we've seen, even in the international realm, the lengths that certain quote-unquote liberal countries are willing to go to to protect human rights. We know what was, um, we know what was given as the justification for the Iraq war, which was very violent, which was there for the protection of human rights. We know, obviously, we've had two world wars, and at least the Second World War in particular had a very, like, human rights zeal to it. So liberals are prepared to go very, very, very far to protect those human rights, as they should, because that's what they view as the ultimate political end. So it's not even a difference in degree. It's a difference in the management administration and for what purpose, I would say. Right, right. No, fa fantastic. I, I can just see viewers on the other end chomping to be in my position to ask you questions. One question I'm, I'm, I imagine someone might wish to ask you is, um, now this might slightly deviate from your, your thesis. And so just, just um, I just want to flag that for, for anyone. Um, but what about these outliers, these political figures that, that um, some would say are outliers to this thesis, those who are seem to be uh, really diametrically opposed to uh, the use of violence um, at any point, uh, even if that means uh, sacrificing their political cause or, or just losing their, their political cause, right? So I'm thinking about typical pacifists, like for instance, like Gandhi or Martin Luther King or these, these types of figures or Jesus or something like this, right? So these types of people seem to be like really opposed to violence um, at, at a fundamental level. Um, I'm just curious what, what, I don't think that that is, you know, against your thesis because you're, you're talking about a state and laws and politics, but I'm just curious to get your opinion on, on those types of people and people in their relationship to violence and politics. I mean, in terms of my opinions on them, I would say that if they say that they're, they're never willing to use violence to achieve a political end, like by, on and by any means thing, then I would question whether their political, what they say is their end is actually their end. So when, cause, cause you know, when people say um, the means don't justify the ends, right? Or the ends don't justify the means rather. So mm -hmm. like, just because an end is good, these means are so bad that they should never be used. I would say that it's usually that they have a different end in conception rather than the end not justifying the means. So when I, so to give an example, like for example, a Kantian may say that the end of, you know, getting a bunch of money doesn't justify the means of say assassinating someone. So then you think on the, on the face of it, it seems, oh, the ends don't justify the means. But it's actually because for a Kantian, the end is satisfying the categorical imperative, which means that you cannot kill anyone. So it's rather that they have a different end that's satisfying the categorical imperative, not that the means don't justify the end. Because as a Kantian will tell you, almost any means is, is enough to satisfy the categorical imperative. Even if you have to lie, and t uh, even if you have to tell the truth and tell the murderer that, you know, your kid's inside, for example, that's the famous example that's always given. So for a, so if Martin Luther King said that he was a pacifist or never willing to use violence, if he was saying that he can achieve his political ends in a better means, without using violence, then I would say he has a, then he could still be completely consistent with what I'm saying. But if he says that achieving whatever is his political end, and even if violence was the best way to achieve it, he still wouldn't do it. I would question whether that's, whether that's actually his legitimate political end in the first place. Right. And then further that point, I would also say that with a lot of like pacifist thinkers over time, I think I haven't done this, but I think it would be really interesting to assess like their success on a political level, whether they were backstopped by other groups who are potentially who, who were willing to potentially be more violent, for example, or look at the amount of success that they've had. Because what's really interesting about Martin Luther King in particular is that his views on like the Amer on, on what was going on in America at his time before he was assassinated, they, they seem to really change over time. Like before the end, he was like, he, he has quite like some like really, really weird quotes. Like he was talking about how his dream had turned into a nightmare and stuff and, you know, different things like that. So I think it would be really interesting if someone could like look at how these people's views changed over time or 
if they saw the success of the political ends that they were trying to bring about, I think that would be really interesting. Right. Well, those, those, that, that kind of uh, concludes my questions for you. And my goodness, you're going to be a, a force to, to reckon with when you get to university and beyond. Um, once again, I'm, I'm sure like some viewers won't know this, but Kiki hasn't even started his university career yet. And it seems like a university, although you haven't gone to it, it seems like it's already gone through you in a way. And so um, for all of the uh, young philosophers out there, um, Kiki's a great example that you can be extremely well read and um, ready to go even before you arrive at university. You should just be delighted with yourself, Kiki, for um, the way you write, the way you speak, the way you think. It's just, it's just mind blowing. I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed. I'll throw it over to uh, Elizabeth now, but this has been a great, a great back and forth. And we have that Liverpool conversation coming up after. Don't forget about that. <laughs> sure. Yeah, well, this, I mean, it's already been basically 40 minutes, I think, but um, that was incredible. I feel like the conversation just firstly, starting from, it was just very fluid. And part of that was because like the responses you gave were actually very, like, I'm literally like taking notes right now. Um, but yeah, I, as for me, I feel like Jeff has covered all the territory in terms of the paper itself. Are there any, I kind of just wanted to pass the floor maybe to Kiki, if you would like, are there any last things or comments about your paper, about philosophy in general, about uh, literally anything that you might want to speak on? If not, that's fine as well. Nah, with regards to the paper, I think we, we covered it really, really well. I just say with regards to philosophy, if anyone's watching, like it's just, it's such a great thing to get into. Like people, I feel like people always question its ability to be put into practice. But I think that's, I think firstly, as we've had that discussion on, on such current affairs, I think it is so important in being put into practice. And I think it's one of those things that if you don't put it into practice yourself, someone's just going to put it into practice for you. Because all of these, all of these thoughts, they do underline, like they permeate so much of our, of our modern thinking, the things we do in life. So it's a thing, in my opinion, you can even try and discover it yourself, or you're just going to have to, you know, assume a bunch of stuff that other people say. So yeah, that's what I'd say on that. Uh, that's brilliant <laughs> yeah and obviously we've we mentioned this multiple times but go read Kiki's paper read it once read it twice read it three times if you really want um and and always and like Kiki said like go in with a question in in mind and see if your opinion on this topic changes based on based on whether his argument is convincing to you or not which I'm sure it probably will be so yeah well that's all we really have for you guys today and, and thank you again Kiki for agreeing to do this and being willing to reschedule things um yeah thanks Kiki bye everyone